I want the presence of God to show up and show out tonight. And where two or three are gathered together in his name, Amen. I will be there. I'll be in the midst of them. We're going to open our service tonight with prayer. Sister Lay is in the hospital. She's very weak. She needs God to really do a miracle for her. And uh, Carmelo, he came through his surgery good Monday. Uh, they think they've got out all the infection off of his foot. But now he really needs God to touch him to where he can get back up on his feet and go to driving and do the things he needs to do. Brother Simmons is so sore until he told me that he wasn't going to be able to make it tonight. So he's not hardly able to even sit. He's just been mainly laying. And so let's pray for him that God will touch him and God will heal him. He said, that's what he's trusting God to do. I asked him, I said, did you go get checked out? I don't need to. I'm just a little sore. I've been praying. Okay. Amen. That's what I tell people to do, right? And whenever they do what you ask them to do, you shouldn't complain. So uh, let's pray that God will just reach down and touch him tonight. I am so glad that you're here with us. And we're going to pray for those that's not able to be with us that God will touch them. But I really want God to move in the house tonight. I really do. Will you stand with us? I feel like God spoke to us in our Sunday services in both of them. I've been feasting on both of the messages. And the message that Brother David Fields preached Sunday night, talking about how that the blood of Jesus Christ has made us all equal to where that we can come into the presence of God. And God hears our prayer. I think God will be covered by the blood. Amen. Some folks don't understand that. But I'm telling you, it was the blood of Jesus. He became that sacrifice that was accepted by the Father. And because of that, we can come boldly. We can come boldly into the presence of an almighty God. So let's pray tonight. Father, I am so thankful for your word that stirs my heart. I thank you, God, for sending men of God by our way to share the gospel. And Lord, they, they have pulled no punches with us, but God, they have shared with us the truth. I know that you are the eternal God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you are our God. You're the one that is in this house tonight, and I pray for a manifestation of God to take place, and only God you can do. I ask you, Lord, will you move mightily? God, I know that there are people tonight that are sick in their bodies, and Lord, they need healing, and I pray for that healing. I pray to God for you to touch them. God, I don't even know what the need may be with a lot of them. But God, you are the great physician. You're the healer. And I just ask you, Lord, to reach down and touch them. And God, these families that have lost loved ones. And God, I'm talking about those, Lord, that death has come, knocked upon the door this week. And Lord, the families are grieving. I pray to God for you to reach down and touch these families tonight. God, strengthen them and help them, Lord, through this hour. Lord, tonight you see the personal needs of everyone that is here. Maybe that need is, God, to get closer to you or to know you even more. Lord, whatever it may be, I just pray the Holy Ghost will work a work that only God can work. And Lord, we will worship you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord together through song. All right, we're going to sing out of the yellow book tonight. Songs we love to sing. Page 62, I believe. Yeah, 62. Come on and praise the Lord. Oh 
Hallelujah. There is power in the blood. Thank you, Jesus. You still believe there's power in the blood? Hallelujah. Well, I can tell you there's no other way of salvation. Amen. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's some things about God's word that we don't necessarily understand. But we know that it's a fact. Amen. We know that it's true. So we accept it because it's God that said it. Right. Hallelujah. Thank God for his word. Amen. He gave us something to believe in, didn't he? Amen. And it was through his word. It's time for us to worship the Lord tonight through our giving and our tithe and offering. Thank you so much for the way that you've been giving. And I'm just asking God to bless our church. And uh, I, I thank God we have some that have been helping us out by giving extra money toward paying off the little yellow house. And I know that's something I want to see happen, and many of you do. Thank you so much. Anything extra that's given to us, we've been putting it toward the principal. And so uh, that's one way to knock it on down. So uh, just ask you to pray. You know, I want God to lead us in everything that we do. I really do. We're going to worship to God tonight through this offering for us to come. Let's just give as given unto the Lord. Be obedient unto God. Obey the Lord. How many want to obey God tonight? Amen. I want to obey the Lord. And that's the reason why that we have come to the house of the Lord is to learn more and more about Him. Brother Rick, will you pray for us tonight? Father, I'm glad, Lord, that you're, you're not like me, Lord. You never sleep. Lord, you never get tired of hearing the prayers of your people, Lord. You're never away on vacation, Lord. But you're always on time, right where we need you to be. Lord, I just pray you to look down upon us tonight. Father, uh, make us cheerful givers, Lord, eager to give into the work of the Lord. Uh, to lift up the name of Jesus, Lord, to this community and to this world. Father, we just invite your presence here to, to bless your church and to bless this offering. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 for someone that is desiring to be in the bright lights. He's just looking for someone to be a gap filler. Right. Yes. Looking for somebody to be a caregiver. Right. And that is just as important. Right. Amen. Yes. We're a family. We're working together. Let me uh, just make a couple announcements right here. Can you believe how fast that October yeah. is going by? I mean, it, it's, it's moving on. We have Brother... Um, Francisco from Clouston that's going to be with us this coming Sunday morning and Sunday evening. He is uh, representing the Hispanic uh, Sunday that, that we have. And like I said, this past Sunday with Brother Peoples, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I know many of you were touched and blessed by his ministry. And then Brother David Fields just come along and preach the word. And it was fantastic. And thank God for it. But come on out and uh, support this next Sunday. Uh, and then on the 26th, it's going to be our fall festivities, our trunk or treat. And we're still needing candy. Anyone that would like to decorate their trunk, you'll see Sister Lisa Moore. She'll set you up in a place. Uh, there's going to be plenty of food for everybody and, and different things here. So invite other people to come be with us 
on the 26th. That's on a Saturday evening from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. All right? And uh, then pick up the bulletin. I, I encourage people to pick up the bulletin to see what's going on so that way we don't have to stand here and just make a lot of announcements. But uh, I also want to ask you, if you can, to bring in uh, food for the Thanksgiving food drive baskets. Uh, need turkey, ham, chicken, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, instant potatoes. I'm not here need for potatoes. Uh, green beans or vegetables, turkey dressing, uh, pies, pumpkin, apple, cherry, peach, or pecan. All those sound good. You'd like to have a slice or two now, wouldn't you? Hallelujah. Uh, and let's just uh, help Sister Frida out. I think that she said that she has about 50 uh, this year. There are a lot of folks out there that are very, very needy. And so let's, let's be praying and let's just work together. Maybe you can pick up a few of these items and, and let's don't make her stress. Church people are real good about making you stress. Wait until the last minute to bring everything in. So let's, let's don't get her stressed out. Let's help her out. If you can, go ahead and start bringing in some of these things. I know some of you have, and we appreciate that so much. I'll be bringing the Word of God to you here in just a very few moments. We're going to start off in the book of Esther tonight. Something I feel like God has just really put into my spirit. And I, I want to ask you a question in this message. Who's in charge? Are you in charge? Is God in charge? Who is in charge of your life? Now before that, you really begin to answer that. Maybe we need to hear what the Lord has to say because some folks say God controls my life. But in all reality, they are still calling the shots. And if you're still calling the shots, then friend, God's not in charge. You're the one that's in control. And I want to share with you some, some illustrations through the Word of God tonight how that we mess up whenever we try to take it back out of God's hands or whenever we just start assuming Without inquiring of God, we mess up. Listen to the words of this song, and you're welcome to sing it along with us. I know it's an old one, but it says, When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Ahead into time, and when he was 
was on the cross I was on his mind Yes, he just close your eyes and I want you to picture that you're back up on the top of that hill with him where he was nailed to that old rugged cross that day and if you can look upon his face if you could ever try to imagine Jesus what are you thinking hanging there between the heavens and the earth and all the pain and all the misery I'm going to tell you that heart was full of love and he was not thinking of himself for it was Jesus that day that looked down upon the men that crucified him and said, Father, forgive them. And I like this because he said he knew me. He knew how filthy, rotten, lost. He knew how big of a sinner that we were. Yet he still loved us. He still went to that old rugged cross for you and I. So can you picture this with me this evening? A look of love was on his face and those thorns were on his head the blood was on that scarlet robe it stained in crimson red and though his eyes were on the crowd that day he looked ahead into time for when Jesus was hanging on the old rugged cross, you and I saw his mind. Yes, he knew me. Yet he loved me. He whose glory makes all the heavens to shine. You know, sometimes the thought of the old rugged cross should still bring us back to tears. Amen. It should cause us to be reminded of how much love that Jesus really had for every one of us. Right. And know this. He knows that it wasn't wasted. Right. He knows that every drop of blood he shed on Calvary's cross was not wasted. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just don't want him to be disappointed in me. I want to serve him with all my heart. How about you tonight? Amen. Will you stand with me for the reading of God's word as we go to the book of Esther, chapter 6, verses 4 through 10. I love this passage of scripture. In fact, I love to read the book of Esther. There's so much in there. And it, it really shows you that no matter where you're at, because these people are in, well, they're living in exile. You can actually say that they, they were captives or prisoners of war. Hey, it doesn't matter to God. You may feel like, preacher, I'm living in exile tonight, but the hand of God can reach down and set you free and give you a promotion right where you're at. That's God. Amen. And the king said, I like this. He's not been able to sleep. He's had the book read to him. Found out that Mordecai had been a good man. And now he wants to honor him. 
And so now as he's pondering and thinking on this, he said, who was in the court? Now Haman was coming to the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. You ever read a story and thought, boy, this is bad timing? <laughs> this is bad timing right here. And then in verse number five, said, and the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, Sometimes you just don't pay to think. <laughs> right? Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? <coughs> Especially whenever all your thoughts are centered around you. Right? And then look at verse number seven, and Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king used to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, the crown royal which is set upon his head, let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And I believe that Haman pictured himself with a crown, royal apparel, riding on the king's horse, and everybody bowing, everybody waving. But this next verse just blowed him out of his saddle. <laughs> the king said to Haman, Make haste, take the apparel of the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew. That sitteth at the king's gate, let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. I ask you tonight, who's in charge? Amen. Who's in charge? Haman Amen. had the king's signet. Hear what I'm trying to tell you. He had the king's ring. He could write laws. He could put the signet up on it. And those laws were laws to be enforced by the king's men. But just because that he had the signet did not mean that he was in charge. Right? Yep. Who's in charge? Father, I ask you if you've ever spoke to our heart, God, that you would speak to our hearts tonight. God, I'm just a messenger. But I pray that the Holy Ghost will prick every one of our hearts. God, that you will speak to us tonight. God, that you will show us mighty things, lovely things, wonderful things. But show us that you're God. Show us the might, the power of our Heavenly Father, who is God above all, for there is no other God. And God, you're in control. It looks like, God, things are just chaotic. And God, everything's in a mess. But God, you've already told us that this is the way it's going to look. And then, Lord, you're going to set it all straight. I know, dear God, that no doubt that Mordecai and them were thinking the same. God, this is a mess. And God, you said, I'm about to set it straight. And God, you did that day, and I thank you for it. But God, help us to realize in our personal life, you're in control. God, you're in charge. We're not. And Father, we fail not to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I started thinking... It's easy for us to forget who is really in charge of things. Who's really in control. It's easy for us to begin to uh, assume responsibilities and make decisions, especially if you have power that's been designated to you. And I can understand Haman. Haman has been let go. Haman can do whatever he wants to. Haman's trying to make the king look good, but he's trying to make himself look better. And Haman's going through all these things, and now he has set himself on a pedestal. All right? I have the king's reign. I have the king's signet. He's allowed me to, to write out laws. He, he's allowed me to do this. He's a, and I don't need to ask him about building no gallows. I know the king is going to say, it's all right. So boys, go ahead and build the gallows. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of the king. That's a dangerous place to get whenever you think that you can take care of the king. Okay? Whenever you think I can manipulate the king, whenever you start thinking I can cause the king to see through my eyes, you're getting yourself in trouble. 
Amen. And this is exactly what old Haman was doing. He he felt like I don't need I don't need to get approval. I do not need to get permission. All I need to do is build it, and the king will agree. After all, he's put me in charge. He might have put you in charge of certain things, but the king is still in charge of it all. Amen. Amen. Right? There's a vast difference there, church. Arrogance and assumption has brought on a lot of great failures. And Haman was loaded with both of them. He had a lot of arrogance about him. And he had a lot of assumption. He was assuming a lot of things. Haman did not realize he was building the gallows and he himself would be hung on. And if you're not careful, arrogance and assumption will cause you to do things that you think is going to benefit me against my enemy. But then it will be turned against you. And the plan that you thought to destroy others with comes back to be your own destruction. And there is a danger that we are living in today because so many people have become so arrogant. And I think about the children of Israel because the children of Israel simply got to the place to where they said, God is not going to require this out of us. God's not going to require us payment on our sin or on our faults. We can do what we want to and God's not going to mess with us any longer. How about this? They went on to say, we have made an agreement with death and hell. That's pretty arrogant, isn't it? Everybody else may go to hell for doing that, but not me. I've already made an agreement with all these things, and you don't have to worry about it. Brother Ed, it's all right if I do all these sins. I have a real good understanding with the devil, and, and hell's not going to be that bad for me. It may be bad on you. But now, don't go there, brother, but everything's going to be all right for me. And you're deceiving yourself. Amen. Hey, you are deceiving yourself. That's where the children of Israel also went. And my Lord, I've been reading back through the book of Jeremiah and seeing everything that happened to them and how that God literally emptied out Judah. God emptied out Jerusalem. God emptied out Israel. And, and people today say, well, I just don't think God would do that. That's what those people said. They had prophets that were prophesying against Jeremiah. Jeremiah was saying, thus saith the Lord, destruction, judgment, wrath, pain, anguish, the armies are coming. And these other people are sitting back and we're saying, ah, oh, don't worry about it. Oh, because we've already seen that God's going to break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar and he's going back. He's not going to do anything to you. But my friend, those very same men were the ones that were carried away. Many of them faced the judgment of God. Many of them died by the sword that they said never would come. I'm Amen. telling you, we're not in charge. We're not in control of this thing. God is. Amen. Right? Amen. And whenever you begin to go against God, then look out because I'm telling you that trouble is on the way. I think about scriptures that I hear people love to quote. And 1 John 4 and 4 is one of them where he said, You are God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now we love that passage of scripture and it talks about how that God is greater. He is greater if you allow him to work through you. Amen. But if, if you say that you have Christ on the inside and he's not the Lord of your life, then friend, I'm telling you, you are deceiving yourself. Amen. Oh, that he's my Savior. You have to understand that Christ is not going to live in a temple. That's what we are. The Bible says that your body is a temple of the Amen. Lord. And Christ is not going to live in a temple where he is not the Lord. Amen. Okay? Well, it's a, it's a temple. Then Christ is not going to live in a temple where he is not the high priest. That's right. Right? Amen. So who's in control? If you're in control of this, well, then Christ is already vacated. That's right, that's right. He has to be the Lord of your life. Yeah. That's the reason why that you have so many people today that are looking upon Christianity and they're saying, man, I don't understand it. You have this one over here saying, thus saith the Lord and doing one thing. This one over here saying, thus saith the Lord and doing something totally different. And it's because that Christ is not the high priest in so many temples today. So men are prophesying. They are speaking in the name of the Lord. And the Lord has nothing to do with it. Lord help us. And so therefore we've got a lot of confused people going around. Right? God help us tonight to see this. Because whenever God is in control, he calls the shots. When God is in control, there is not a bunch of confusion. And I will ask you this. I want to ask you this. I want you to think, ponder upon these things tonight. 
You say that God's in control of your life. I ask you, do you inquire of the Lord before making decisions? Or do you just go ahead and make them? And say, oh, God's going to bless me. God's not in control of your life. Right. If you're making all the decisions without inquiring of him, do you listen and obey his voice? Either that small, still voice that will speak to you or through the scriptures, he would thunder to you. Do you just write it off, do your own thing? Because if you do, he is not the Lord. He's not in control. You still are, or you think so. Do you assume that you're making the right decision without praying? Do you assume that you're making the right decision without inquiring from the Lord? Do you assume that you're making the right decision without receiving an answer? Amen. Help us tonight. Sometimes because God does not thunder an answer to us, we assume that his approval is upon it. That's right. That's right. Amen. God does not need us to assume anything. And I want to take you here and show you at, at least two places in God's word where that assuming things can really get you into a lot of trouble. Great men of God. Let me show you one of them. Joshua. Joshua was a great man of God. I mean, he is the, the man God chose to fill Moses' shoes. I wouldn't want that. I'm telling you, how can you fill the shoes of a man that speaks face to face with God? Okay? How can you do that? There is a reason why that Moses could go speak face to face with God. We don't have the time to cover all of these things tonight. But Joshua was a man that was learning to listen and learning to hear God. But Joshua had to learn through great price, through great price, the problem of doing things without inquiring of the Lord and just assuming this is what God wants. All right? I'll, I'll take you back. They crossed over Jordan. They built an altar out of the stones. And God has given them a great victory at Jericho. There has been a great circumcision. It looks like everything is going good and everybody's coming back. The law is being fulfilled. We're practicing the law. And, and God just gave us a wonderful victory. And the walls of Jericho have come tumbling down. And so as they begin to look around, at the next city that was to be conquered, the Bible tells us that there was a little town out there that was known as Ai. And Ai was not as big as uh, Jericho. And so he knew that God already told him, you're going in to conquer this land. Just because that the commander-in-chief has told you to go in and conquer the land does not mean that you do not need to consult with him about your next move and your next plan. In fact, you need to be consulting with God quite often about your life, Amen. asking Him, what is the plan? What do you want me to do? Because God, I cannot see things as you see them. Amen. And so here is Joshua. I mean, you know, this thing is just going to be a breeze. Why? I don't need to get everybody up early. I don't need all the soldiers to put on all of their warrior outfits. And I don't need everybody to be so stressed out. So what I'll do, I'll just choose out a small group of men. Uh, and I'm going to send them out here to AI. But you know what? The problems don't always lie where you assume that the problem would be. Because in the time of war, you think that the problem is going to be the enemy. There, there may be some real sharp shooter sitting up on the wall that might be able to hurt some of your men. Or maybe there are some that's lying in wait out there. And so we begin to assume uh, that the problem is going to lie on the outside of, of our camp, on the outside of our army. And that's exactly what Joshua was assuming. And if it rises up out there, God is with us and the enemy is going to be defeated. Uh, but what happens uh, if the enemy has made his way inside of the camp uh, and you don't know? The commander-in-chief, who is the Lord God Almighty, knows all things, uh, and there was no secret kept from him. And so God saw trouble brewing from within. But Joshua, this great man of God, 
He was not thinking about trouble from within. Why should I inquire of the Lord? He just gave us Jericho. He's promised us all of this land. That's right. But Joshua, you still need to talk to God because God is searching the hearts of the people that are supposed to be fighting for him. And God is not going to be just against your enemy, but God will be against your army if they do not comply personally with the laws and the commandments of which I have given. Amen. Church, we need to hear this uh, because we can we can pronounce judgment on everybody on the outside of the church. Uh, but you better remember the word of God because he said that judgment must first begin within the house of the Lord. Uh, and so while, while, while the church is so uh, amused by everything that's going on uh, in our political world and, and in this crazy chaotic mess that is going on all around the world, uh, I'm telling you God's still watching the heart of the church. He's still looking to see what the church is doing. And he's still waiting to see if we are going to commune with him, come back to him, inquire of him, and realize he's still in control. He's in charge. Oh, but Brother Smiley, God's given me the authority. Joshua could say that. And God had given him that authority. But I'm telling you that he's God. God may give us responsibilities. He may give us duties and obligations. But he's God. And we need to go back and inquire of him. Oh Lord, what shall we do? Amen. What shall we do? And so God looks on, on the internal parts. It's kind of like an engine, you know. You, you don't see where that maybe a, a piston's coming loose. After all, nobody ever worries about the piston because, you know, that's embedded down there inside of that engine and, and you wouldn't know anything about it uh, unless that you tore it apart or unless it comes apart and comes out the side of the engine. Come on. Right. Then it's too late, right? That's right? Some people think just because they heard the rod knocking, it just meant to accelerate <laughs> until the rod quit knocking. Yep. Come on, help me out tonight. I'm telling you, the internal part means something to God. Amen. It means something to God. It often will cost you whenever you do not take time to inquire of the Lord. Here's what he said in Joshua chapter 7, verse 5. And the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men. 36 men died. Why? Well, because of Achan. I'd like to say didn't have to die if they would have just inquired of the Lord, the Lord would have told them sin is in the camp That's right. and I'm not going with you until you deal with the sin in the camp. There you go. No, we're not assuming sin's in the camp. We're only assuming that God put me in charge. So woo, here we go. Yeah. Right? After all, since God put me in charge, how can I fail? By not inquiring of the Lord. I'm not inquiring of God. And the Bible said that there were 36 men, for they chased them uh, from before the gate even unto uh, Sherom and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And look at verse number 6. And Joshua rent his clothes. Uh, fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until evening time. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust upon their heads. Picture all this with me. Now, I, come on. It, it's all right to daydream right now as long as your daydream is, a, is upon Joshua and the elders of Israel right here. Because now there's devastation. 36 men are going to have to be buried somewhere. And there's wives that are crying. There's sons and daughters that are weeping. Uh, and now these guys are just falling upon their head. Uh, man, they have they, they have rent their, their, their clothes. And, and now they're laying out there. They've got dust upon their head. Where it happened? Where did we go wrong? You did not inquire of God. Amen. Now, I like this next part because here's what happens. Uh, God often gets the blame when we don't inquire of him. Imagine that. Right. Come on. That's right. God often gets the blame. It's your fault, God, Joshua said. Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou? God, why have you brought this people over Jordan 
to deliver them into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. And then look at this man. My Lord, I tell you what, this sounds so much like people today, whenever trouble comes, as long as we're living on the mountaintop, that we're all right. Amen. As long as we're shouting and, and all the clouds have silver lines that we can say, Woo, hallelujah, I'm going to make it. I'm a strong child of God. Oh, don't you know God just gave me Jericho? Yeah, well, you just lost AI. That's right. And so now he's over there saying, God, why have you done all of this? Would to God we had been content and to wear on them? Wait a minute. Joshua, I cannot believe that you're saying this. You were in the crowd that day when it were the ten men that came back and said, What you just said, God killed them. Come on. They're saying be content being here in the wilderness. You can't go across into the promised land. There's too many giants. There's too many walled cities over there. And Joshua, you and Caleb stood up and said, if God is for us, uh, then we don't need to worry about these things. God's going to fight for us. Uh, but now the time has come. He's not inquired of God. So now he's cast down into the valley of despair uh, and he's saying, why God? Uh, surely, Lord, we should have just been content to wander another 40 years out in the wilderness. Uh, but I like like it whenever God begins to say, hey, snap out of it, buddy. Uh, oh, Lord, uh, help us to see this today. And he said, oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? Uh, it, it's kind of like, God, you, you put me out here. God, you're really making me look bad. <laughs> Come on, that, isn't that what he's saying? Amen. God, you said that, that you chose me and we're going to in here, we're going to take the promise like where you are. But you're going to learn to listen to me, Joshua. Amen. Amen. You're not God. Amen. Right. Amen. You're not God. Lord. None Lord. of us are God. Hallelujah. And if we stop inquiring of God, we're going to get in trouble. Joshua had in a lot of trouble. Got into a lot of trouble here. And now he's saying, Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies? Tell them the truth. Joshua, I'm about to teach you what to do whenever that you're losing. Because if I sent you to win and you start losing, there's a reason why you're losing and not winning. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. God, help us right here, please. He said, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it. Now we're going to worry about rumors. Uh -huh. That's right. Come on. Kind of sounds like the world we're living in on it. Amen. We are afraid of what somebody's going to say about us. All the shame of it. I, I like I like the old cartoons. You know those Looney Tunes. And I like the one where that, that old Tom Cat, Daddy Cat's walking around and he is supposed to be trying to catch a rat. And it turns out it's a kangaroo. Yeah, how many of you remember watching that? Thank you. And then whenever Whenever the little baby cat's there and he sees his dad's all beaten up and all that he can see is that little rat, not the kangaroo, he starts walking around and saying, oh, the shame of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the shame of it. I believe that's the way that Joshua was feeling right here. He was afraid that somebody's going to be looking on and saying, oh, the shame of it. That's right. Yep. Oh, it was a shame. It was a shame. 36 men had lost their lives. 36 men had died because somebody had failed to inquire of the Lord. Amen. But it, it, it was a no-win situation. Then why didn't you win? Why didn't you win if it was a no -win? Listen to me. Listen to me. Here we go. And he said, what will thou do unto thy great name? Now he's going to try to make God feel bad. You're not going to make God look bad. God's still God. Amen. God's going to outlive everything. That's right. Come on. He is. You're, you're not going to make God look bad. And there's a world that ain't saying, where is God? Honey, he's about to show up. That's right. That's right. The world's not going to like it when he does show up, but he's going to show up. That's right? Amen. right? Amen. So, so I want you to look at this because God lets him babble. God lets him talk. Just like a lot of times God lets us talk. And just like God let uh, Job talk. But then in verse 10, the Lord said unto Joshua, 
Get up. Get up, Joshua. Why are you laying there upon your face? Well, God, I thought I just gave a pretty good explanation of the reason why I was laying on my face. Because that's what you're assuming. Let me give you the facts about this thing, Joshua. And look at verse number 11. And verse number 11 says, Israel has sinned. You want to know the reason why 36 men died? Because there was sin in the camp you didn't know anything about. And he said, they have transgressed against my covenant, which I commanded them. They have even taken of the accursed thing. They've also stolen, dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Now listen to me. I'm telling you, God's getting pretty plain right here because he's telling him, he said, this is what's happened. They have stolen it, but now they're trying to hide it from me. I like what Brother People said Sunday morning. How can you hide from God? He's the one that planted the tree. You can't hide behind the tree God planted. You can't hide in a cave that God made. You can't hide from God. Oh yeah, well this is my tent. I'll put it where I want to. And God won't know who you think you are. And, and better yet, who do you think God is? The all-seeing eye of God is running everywhere. We're not doing anything in secret. That's right. When nobody else knows about it, but the one that counts, he knows all about it. You're not hiding from him. Nope. He's God. Amen. He is God. That's the reason why that we should inquire of him. Because his eyes are still running to and fro throughout this earth. There is nothing hid from him. God sees our tomorrows whenever we cannot even understand our yesterdays. God knows more about our future and has a better understanding than what we do of our very present. I'm telling you, God is saying inquire of me and entrust me. Amen. Entrust me. God help us right here. And then he went on to say in verse 12, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were a curse. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy their curse thing from among you. I believe if I was Joshua right then, I would have told the priest to go and offer up a sacrifice unto God. It's going to be my sacrifice, and it's going to be a sacrifice of repentance. I opened up my mouth, stuck my foot into it when I should have been praying and saying, God, show me. Hallelujah. I was putting the blame on God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, help. Well, maybe sometimes that's where we're at. Maybe we ought to be back down in an altar saying, oh, God, please forgive me. I should never blame you. Amen. Amen. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Amen. Help us. So if Joshua would have just remembered who's in charge, and sought God's advice, it could have. It could have saved 36 men. Okay? I'm still talking about Joshua here, so just hold on with me just for a moment. Because it seems like Joshua and the elders. I'm not to, going to put the blame right back upon Joshua. I, I'm going to put the blame upon the whole group. A few days go by, and there's some strangers that show up in the camp. Okay? These guys look like men that have been traveling for years. I mean, they're covered with dust. They have some of the worst clothes on their body. And it looks like that these guys have really, really just been out there. In fact, the Bible said in Joshua chapter 9, as we read about the Gibeonite people, how that they came in, they lied. Okay? They lied. Don't you know that God knows the truth? And some of these guys already had some suspicions. How do we know? Why don't you inquire of God who tells the truth? Cannot lie. No. They just assumed these guys were telling the truth, that they were a long ways off. And, and when I started reading that chapter 9 again, the Bible said three days later, they found out the truth. Okay? Okay? They found out the Gibeonites were not people from all, far off. They were nigh unto them. They were supposed to have been some of the people that God said, I want you to destroy because they're part of the Amorites. But they made a covenant with them. And they said, we're not going to kill you. We're going to, we're going to do you good. How did that happen? Lord, I wish I had a long time to preach on this. Because they came and played on their ego. That's right. That's right. Yep. 
They came playing up on their sympathy. They came and built them up to where that the men no doubt feel a little arrogant. Yeah, you talk about us. Yeah, you're right. We took down those kings on the other side. Yeah, it was us that, man, we crushed all the walls of Jericho. No, you didn't. God did. Amen. You were not the one that took down no kings on the other side. It was God that empowered you. And that's another thing. Whenever that you ever start taking the credit for what God is doing, look out. Amen. Look out. God's got a way of getting his glory back. That's right. Amen. God has a way of getting his glory back. Amen. So if we want to say, oh, look what I've done, you better take another look in that mirror and say, hey, wait a minute. I cannot do this. I did not do this. It was God that did this. I was just a handpiece. Amen. I was just the mouthpiece. I was just the chosen vessel. Three days later, now people are very upset. I mean, they're very upset with them, and they want to go in and slay them. And the elders and Joshua stand up and say, no, you can't do that because we made a covenant with them in the name of the Lord God that we should have inquired. We made a covenant with them in his name. Now, we can't do that. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to make them slaves. We'll make them to be the burden bearers. They can cut the wood. You need firewood cut? Hey, I'm telling you now, they're, they're trying to paint a pretty picture right here because they messed up. Right? No. If you got to draw water, get one of them. It's going to be all of our servants. Okay? So it looks like it's going to be settled, right? It's not settled. It's not settled. It never was settled. There were people in Israel that would not forget and they would not forgive the Gibeonites for lying to them. All right? Joshua dies. The elders of Israel die with him. The Gibeonites are still amongst the children of Israel and there's children of Israel that's not forgotten what the Gibeonites have done. They lied to us. They lied to us. All the judges come along. The Gibeonites are still living there. The children of Israel... Still not forgetting what they've done. They lied to us. They lied to us. And so now here comes along the time whenever Samuel is a prophet. He's a man of God. And it seems like God is moving and doing wondrous things. But up underneath of it, there's still a group that will not forgive. Mm -hmm. Though they were not there, and though the lie was not given unto them, it was given unto my grandparents. So they lied to them. All right? The people that done all the lions are already dead, so you're going to blame it on the kids. That's right. Hatfields and McCoys, isn't it? Yeah. And we don't even know why we're feuding. I think that their granddaddy over there done something to my granddaddy. Huh? Maybe it was my grandma that shot their grandma. I don't know. All I know is I don't like them. That's right. Help us, sweet Holy Ghost. Amen. And because it, they, they would not let it go, sometimes it's the undercurrent. Sometimes it's that undertow. That's right. And then Saul becomes king. Right? Now, you have to understand that Saul has some problems where he does not have a lot of confidence. Number one, he does not have a whole lot of confidence in God, but God had chosen him. And number two, he did not have a lot of confidence in himself. He was always fearful that the children of Israel was going to leave him. That's the reason why he disobeyed God even about the sacrifices and did not wait for Samuel. That's another message for another time. But the Bible says this, and I want you to read this with me in 2 Samuel 21 and verse 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, not during the time of Saul, we're going to get back to Saul in just a moment, but this is in the time of David. And David goes back and asks the Lord, why are we having famine? Why have you made the heavens brass, Lord? I don't understand it. And the Lord answered, it's Saul. He's dead. You know, it's what Saul did before he died. Okay, God. And said for his bloody house. Well, I know that, well, God, you could be right. He tried to kill me. He said, no, the Gibeonites. Wait a minute, God, wait, wait, wait. You 
you're talking about the people that lied to Joshua. Yeah. You mean he wouldn't let it go either? That's right. Well, kind of sounds like a lot of other people in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Go and blame it on somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right? But look at verse number two with me. Verse number two said, And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Okay? I I'm telling you, whenever you stop inquiring of God, look out, trouble is going to come. Amen. And can I tell you, whenever you made a covenant, God heard it, and especially if you made it in the name of God, you better honor it. Amen. You better honor that covenant. Yep. And I know that some people would argue the fact, yeah, well, it was Joshua and those elders that made the covenant. We didn't. I know God's word doesn't work like that, does it? No, it doesn't. He made it a covenant with the people and said, this is what Israel will do, and this is what you're going to have to do. And so now these men are looking back up on David and the people of Israel, the people of Judah, somehow or another, they did not want to forgive the Gibeonites. They did not want to let it go. And so now, literally decades, decades, if not hundreds of years later, it's still festering. It is still coming up to a boil. And then they did not realize that because they violated the covenant, that Joshua should have inquired of the Lord. Now, can I take you back there? That's right. If Joshua would have just inquired of the Lord, this day would have never been in Israel. Right. God would have told him, these people are not who they say they are. They're Amorites. They're your enemy. That's right. No, he didn't, he didn't take the time to do that. So now it's still like a sore spot. That's right. Amen. A sore Amen. spot. Several months ago, I, I went to shoot my pistol. And whenever I did, the slide came back and took a chunk of skin right off the joint. It hurt. Amen. I'm telling you, it hurt. It bled and it hurt. And I would look down at that thing, even after it looked like that, it was healed. And I would tell Tina, I said, that thing is still so sore. It's sore from within. It looked like it had healed on the outside, but it was so sore from within that you couldn't hardly touch it. And a lot of times you didn't even want to bend the joint. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you tonight? Yeah. Because there's sometimes you think that things are healed up, but down on the inside, it's still sore. That's right. Yes, it is. It's still sore. And if you don't let God heal it up, one day it's going to come to the top. That's right, man. Right? If Joshua would have just inquired of the Lord, maybe none of this stuff would have ever happened. But now look at the cost of it. God help us to see this. The, in, in verse number five, whenever David is saying, then what can I do for you? They answered the king, the man that, command, that consumed us, that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any coast of Israel. Let seven of his sons be delivered. Innocent. Innocent people. Innocent people. Right here. Let them be delivered and we will hang them up unto the Lord and give him Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. And that's exactly what he did. They hung seven of the sons, the grandsons of Saul. And then God began to open back up the heavens and God began to send rain again. Listen to me. God's in control. We need to take time to talk to him lest it cost us more than what we want to pay. Amen. Amen. Lest it cost us on down the road far more than what we thought it would ever cost us. And I'm going to try to close right here. Sister Moore, if you'll come to the piano for me. In Philippians 2 and 13, he said, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God that's wanting to work in us. But God cannot work unless that we are willing to inquire of him and allow him then to work through us.
So I'm telling you that tonight we need to recognize who's in charge. All right? And if you're one of those people tonight that is just walking around thinking, hey, people know who I am. Can I, can I just encourage you? Get over yourself yes. before it destroys you. Amen. Get over yourself before it takes you down and innocent people with you. You're not in control. God's in control. Amen. God has a way of bringing you down. And how many people though will hurt before God brings you back to make you to realize He's really in control. God is really in control of this thing. So I want to encourage you tonight. Don't look at your own ability, but learn to trust in His anointing. Amen. I can't do this within myself. I must have your anointing. If you ever get to the place to where that you're saying, I don't need the anointing, and you, you say, Pastor, I never say that verbally. I never just speak that. You're right. You're smart enough, but yet you're acting it out. You're carrying it out. I don't have to pray like I used to. Like one preacher made the statement. He said, I've already paid my dues. I don't have to pray like I used to. Honey, I'm going to tell you right now. You, these are not dues. This is a smart man that goes to inquire of the Lord. It's a smart man that keeps it in his heart and in his mind. I can't do this within myself. I need the anointing. Amen. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you, don't rely on your potential. But please... Rely upon His anointing. Don't rely upon what you may think is my ability, my, my potential. And do not focus on who you are in Him, but focus on who He is in you. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. Oh, God, help me. And stop asking, what can you do through Him? And start asking, uh, what can Jesus do through me? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Him. And He'll get in the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Amen. Who's in control? Who's in charge? I'm telling you, it must be God. It must be God. God must be the one in charge. Amen. Amen. I read this in... I thought that it was so good. I want to read it to you. It said, God is really interested in changing you and I more than He is in changing our circumstances. God's more interested in having a personal relationship with me and you than all of our surroundings. And a lot of times if we would just back up and realize if God can have what He wants, that personal relationship and you and I, then all the other things are just going to dissipate. They're going to fade away. Because when God begins to rise up in you, who can stand? What can stand? He is the one that whenever, whenever, whenever His voice begins to tremble, the heavens begin to shake, and the earth begins to pay attention, and the waves of the sea can only roar out. Oh my God, don't you understand? It is He that controls the winds. It's God that controls it all. And when God's in control, there is nothing that can stand. But it's whenever you and I get in between us and God, and we when we begin to think that we're in control, we're in charge. That's when chaos happens. That's when bad decisions are made. And that's when fatalities happen. Right. Amen. Will you stand with me tonight? Oh, how I want God to use us. How I want God to use this church. But we must always realize it is not us that's in control. It's God. It's got to be God. And whenever we inquire of God, and we allow God to work. Great things happen. You see, they inquired of the Lord about Jericho. Did not great things happen? It was God that crumbled the walls. Amen. It was Israel that said, God has given unto us this great victory. But on the next time, they'd already begin to fill the roads and felt like, man, we can do this. No, we can't. Anytime that you and I ever start to do anything for God and we start feeling like I can do this, then friend, go back to an altar cry out to God and say, God, please forgive me. This is not my work. It's your work. This is not my ministry. It's your ministry. God, this is not my church. This is your church. Amen. And God, you've got to be God of it all. Father, speak to us tonight. And help us, God, to humble ourselves down before you. Help us, God, to humble ourselves down before you. God, please, please, God, for you're in control. God, you sent, you sent the drought to get David's attention. Three years into that drought, David went back to say, God, why? 
He inquired of you. God, maybe there are people here tonight, Lord, they're going through a spiritual trap in their life and they don't know why. Maybe, God, they need to go back and inquire of you tonight. Say, God, why have I missed you? And God, if we've missed you, then please show us how to get back on the right track to do the will of God, to do the will of God. You know, tonight I'd like to have everyone that, that would just like to come and pray. Will you just come and join me here around the altars tonight? There's no special way I want you to pray. I just want you to pray from your heart. Maybe God showed you some things tonight that you need to pray about. Would you just come and pray? Sister Morris sings, will you just pray? Talk to God.
awesome God. He's a mighty God. He's a powerful God. How can you describe him? He's God. He's holy. He's pure. He's faithful. He does not lie. He's a God of truth. He's a God of integrity. God honors his word. God's made a covenant. God will keep the covenant. He will not break it. It pays to inquire of the Lord, and it also pays then to follow through with what God gives you. Several years ago, I had a young man that called me up and said, I want you to pray, and if God gives you a word, and said, let me know. I began to pray for him, and I called him back up, and I told him, I said, this is what I feel like God has laid up on my heart. And I told him, and he says, no, no, that won't work. That will not work. Act like he got very upset with me. As I continue to pray, the Spirit of the Lord spoke into my heart and said, He's caught up in a whirlwind that feels like He cannot get out of it. I called Him back up. And I told Him, I said, The Spirit of the Lord has laid up on my heart that you feel like you're caught up in a whirlwind and you cannot get out of it. He said, That's how I feel. He would not listen. He kept going on. It went just like He thought that it should go. And can I tell you, He's still paying for it today. He's still paying for it today. And I want to tell you, God's way is the best way. You may not think it is right now. You may think it's the toughest. You may think it's the hardest. But I'm telling you, God's way is the best way. Will you stand with me tonight? It would be real easy to start all over again. And I know you don't want to hear it again. I'm going to tell you, God's real. If you will inquire of Him and follow Him. The psalmist said that he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. And if you will understand the psalmist, that's exactly where God wants to lead you. You may be in the midst of chaos and trouble right now, but God wants to lead you beside the still waters. And he wants to restore your soul, but you have to inquire of Him and follow Him. Father, tonight I thank You. Thank You, Lord, for Your presence that I know that is still in this place. God, I can tell you tonight, Lord, from experience, there's been times that I've been so weak. God, to try to do your will, that God, it, it took your presence, it took your spirit, it took your strength. And God, there may be some here tonight that have been praying to do the will of God, but they find themselves weak. And God, they don't see where that they can do the will of God, but I'm asking you, Lord, to break the chains. God, to break the yokes that are upon them to do the will of the Father. Some of them that God are bound to the chains of their past and they do not feel worthy. None of us are but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus washes us and cleanses us and makes us worthy. I understand better that God were that the Apostle Paul said that my righteousness is as filthy rags. Then Lord, he looked into the righteousness of God. And Lord, that's the righteousness that we cling to. So I ask you tonight, God, to speak to your people's heart. Help us, Lord, to follow wholeheartedly after you. We love you, God, with all of our heart and require of the Lord to do the will of the Father. God, will you just be with us and bring us back at the appointed time, Lord, and give us an outpouring of your spirit, Sunday. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen.